Um, welcome everybody uh, to the Critical Antiquities Workshop, the first for session two of 2023. Um, uh, before I introduce our um, distinguished guests, I'll uh, like to acknowledge the country on which the University of Sydney stands, because that's where we're meeting today. Um, the University of Sydney stands on the, um, the, the sorry, country of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We'd like to pay respects to elders, uh, past, present, and coming up through the ranks. Um, but uh, our distinguished speaker today, Patricia Springborg, it's, it's wonderful, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce her. Um, Patricia Springborg has had a long and dis distinguished career, so it's both a real honour to have her here, to be introducing her, and also um, daunting because I won't do her justice. Um, she's had uh, many wonderful highlights in her career, and I'm, I'm still just uh, scratching the surface of that. Um, but uh, I'll do my best to do her justice. Um, it's great to have her here so accessible at the University of Sydney, where since 2019 or 2020 you've been an honorary professor, is that right? Yep. Um, but it's not the first time she's been affiliated with the University of Sydney. Uh, a Kiwi by birth, uh, Patricia completed bachelor's and master's degrees in history and politics at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand, with the eminent historian of political thought, John Pocock. Um, that sounds like an enviable uh, education. And after that, she headed off to uh, the UK, where she completed bachelor's and doctoral degrees at the University of Oxford. She then rose through the ranks of academia and helped establish political theory here in Sydney between 1974 in the early 2000s, and I just missed her. I came just after she left, which I've always regretted. Um, but after that, she spent many years as a research professor in Europe, taking up positions in Sweden, in Italy, in Germany, most recently at the Humboldt University of Berlin. Uh, she has many, many publications to her name, spanning nearly the whole gamut of political thought in the Western tradition, as far as I can tell. Um, but I'm only going to be able to mention the books. And if you're interested to dig deeper into um, Patricia's um, career and her publications, they are on the, uh, the University, Humboldt University Berlin website, so you can see them there. But let me um, name the books that she has to her name. So the first was The Problem of Human Needs and the Critique of Civilization, published in 1981 by Alan Unwood. A fantastic book, one that I've delved into and um, reaped many rewards from myself. Um, she has Royal Persons, Patriarchal Monarchy and the Feminine Principle, um, published in 1990. Western Republicanism and the Oriental Peace, published by Polity Press. Prince. So was that? Did Prince. I say Prince? What did I say? Peace. Did I say Peace? Prince. I'm sorry. The Oriental Prince. I can't read. That's, this is the problem. I'm discovering the, the source of my weaknesses. Um, published in 1992. And then she has been an editor um, of a series of works by Mary Astle. Um, I won't read all of them here, there are a, a numerous titles there. Um, she was an editor of the Cambridge Companion to Hobbes' Leviathan. Um, she has edited um, with Patricia Stadline and Paul Wilson, Hobbes' Historia Ecclesiastica. Um, she, uh, and this is um, not to mention um, the book which she is currently working on and which um, from which our paper today comes. Um, and I haven't worked out what the working title of this book is. Patricia, can you tell us the working title of the book? The working title is Reading Hobbes Backwards, Hobbes, the Papal Monarchy and Islam. Fantastic. Um, so I'll stop rambling now, um, but please join me in thanking Patricia for being here and welcoming her. Well, thank you, Tristan and Ben, uh, for this opportunity, which is a bit daunting for me, uh, since the book is actually finished, but not yet published. Uh, I must say that I am incredibly impressed by the concept of the Group of Antiquities Network and the way that it can conduct transcontinental uh, workshops. Um, I have, to, and I understand from talking to Ben today and talking to Tristan that in some respects it's a product of COVID uh, and a very innovative one. 
And I thank them so much uh, for inviting me to participate. I hope I live up to expectations. Um, I have to tell you that this book was also a product of COVID. I had an office in the Center for British Studies at the Mughal University um, that was not far from my home. And very often, I was the only single person in the building. And the administrators very kindly said, Patricia, we don't know if you are here or not here. <laughs> so the whole building would be heated just for me. And I came in, to be honest, some of the time, seven days a week, because I had nothing better to do. And I really wanted to get this book finished before I returned to Australia in August of last year. So we're talking about the post-COVID phenomenon here. Yeah. Well, in honor of the and critical antiquities uh, network, I will talk mainly uh, initially about uh, Hobbes, the papal, papal monarchy and Islam. But for those of you who are not Hobbes scholars, it may seem strange uh, to throw Hobbes into the mix. But um, Hobbes lived during the English Renaissance, during the lifetime of Shakespeare, of Ben Jonson, with whom he was acquainted. And he was uh, on the cusp between scribal publication and print publication. And there were many right up until Dryden, who made the case that print publication destroyed the livings of young Oxford and Cambridge educated youth who uh, became pens for hire. And Hobbes was himself a pen for hire. Hobbes was a baronial client. Um, the whole story of Hobbes is a mess of manuscripts. But there are manuscripts that we have and manuscripts that are missing. Um, Hobbes had a lifelong project for which he became famous. And that was itself indebted to the Aristotle commentary tradition. His project, ever since his Oxford days, was to write a treatise on man body and citizen in three books uh, that would provide a curriculum and it was heavily indebted to Aristotle's physics. So but the <laughs> difficult thing about this is that these three books, these the three parts of the project came to print publication out of sequence. So man, they nominate only was published in 1658. De Corpora, which was the project he was working on right from the beginning, which is so indebted to Aristotle's physics, only came to print publication in 1655. And De Kiwe uh, on the citizen came to print publication first in the uh, widely circulated publication of the De Kiwe in Paris, in Sorbiers, um, under Sorbier, and then in um, 1651 with Leviathan. And Leviathan was indeed Hobbes's first printed book. This doesn't mean, however, this, that this was the sequence in which the intimates of Hobbes's circle became acquainted with his work because they made their own uh, transcriptions. So we they made their own manuscripts uh, for their own purposes to remind themselves. And we have some of those. Uh, and uh, at the same time, so Hobbes was a pen for hire for these powerful barons uh, the earls of Devonshire and Newcastle. 
But he was also connected with the Mersenne circle in Paris. And there they made manuscripts also. Hobbes' own manuscripts uh, of his own works, uh, he destroyed when he was under indictment for blasphemy in the 1660s. So it's a mess of manuscripts, some of which we have and some of which are missing. Uh, but the idea that Leviathan, by naming his major political work and first printed work, uh, Leviathan, uh, became a decoy that in some ways protected Hobbes against the charge of scholasticism. Uh, has been suggested um, by Noel Malcolm, who did, uh, who's probably the most prominent and accomplished pop scholar. Um, but he only gives uh, some of the reasons. This was, I think, a momentous decision on Hobbes' part. I do believe that it was a last minute decision. Um, in May, of, so Leviathan was published in 1651. In May of 1650, Robert Payne, who was Hobbes' amanuensis, because Hobbes had palsy and his handwriting was illegible, most of us don't have that excuse. Um, May, in May of 1650, Payne recorded that Hobbes had. Hobbes was working on his English politique, 37 chapters of which were already completed, I've been projected 50, actually he's only ever reached 47. Uh, and Malcolm speculates that the reason why Hobbes did this was because he was acquainted with a commentary tradition, Jesuit commentary tradition, done by Jesuits and Capuchin fathers, which, which were, was held in um, Madame Mercian's Paris Library. And that one of those who was very close to Mercian, one of those commentators, Baldock, had suggested that uh, Leviathan meant incorporation. And this is indeed what Hobbes takes Leviathan to mean. Now, um, the very famous frontispiece to Hobbes' Leviathan uh, is in fact a perfect uh, depiction of the corpus mystical, which was for the church after Constantine the theory behind the papal monarchy. Um, that uh, the Pope represented Christ in what was a mystical body, um, that's to say, uh, a persona ficta, uh, and that uh, this, of course, became out of the Reformation, a depiction of the king as the representative of Christ in a mystical body of which all Christians were part, which is why in the depiction all these little people make up the body of the Leviathan, just incorporating them. Um, and yet, uh, and indeed, uh, this is Hobbes' interpretation of Leviathan. 
it seems almost certain that Malcolm is right, that Hobbes, who may have met Baldock in fact, was impressed by this idea of the Leviathan as a figure for incorporation and that uh, he renamed his text accordingly. But of course, uh, as it all played out, uh, the term, the name Leviathan uh, was a double-edged sword because it represented also Puritan views uh, about uh, the church and uh, the monarchy and uh, the king, for instance, refused to accept Hobbes' presentation copy and banned him from the court. Now, there's something interesting about the presentation copies. Uh, you'll notice on the frontispiece, I should have had an image of it, that the book, the words from the book of Job, um, on there is no power on earth to be compared to him, which flies like a banner over the top and hardly fits, is actually missing from the presentation copy. Uh, I'm just going to drop a copy of the uh, artist page in the chat. So oh, that's wonderful. I have one on hand all at all, at all times. <laughs> oh, really? Goodness. That's more than you can say for me. <laughs> there are reasons that I'll go into why Hobbes uh, chose the Bible, and they're not, I think, entirely due to Baldwin. Uh, so I uh, take Malcolm's suggestion one step further and claim that Hobbes did indeed decide at the last moment to uh, rename his text Leviathan. And it would have otherwise just been called the matter, form, and power of a commoner of ecclesiastical and civil, which is now the subtitle. Uh, and this all ties in with the uh, the uh, reception of Hobbes uh, and the, uh, the charges of blasphemy and so on and so forth, but he, it was, must have been considered an incredible risk to rename the work of Ireland, and yet Hobbes had very good reasons for taking that risk, as I should try to show. So, I'm clearly trying to make the case that Hancock's has to be read backwards, that he's clearly in the Aristotle commentary tradition, and that to which the Arab, Arabic translation movements were critical, and that Hobbes owes far more to scholasticism and the papal monarchy than he could possibly admit. Now, Leviathan, which turned out to be a decoy, took over the whole project which is, I think, uh, uh, why he had to write the Historia Ecclesiastica to redeem himself. Uh, but even there, there's a printer's intervention where the printer introduces the names of the Bible and the um, and that threatened to derail this project. Hobbes is read forth, typically, as a harbinger of the Enlightenment. Um, but those who read them I mean, this in the, in the whole of the 20th century has been an effort to extricate Hobbes from the great books tradition. Uh, and most of that, uh, uh, the, the Cambridge School has been absolutely exemplary in this. Um, but even uh, so, <clears throat> without the examination of Hobbes' drafts, letters, regulations, recollections and boasts, where, and his efforts to publicize the scribal publications of a courtier's client, uh, the whole story has still not definitively been <coughs> told. Indeed, Malcolm believes it never can be. I am making 
<laughs> you to prove them wrong. Yeah, I'm trying to prove them wrong. Um, so the book actually began like between different caught between different projects. I've had a long-standing interest in ancient Middle Eastern sources written out of the European canon. And this made me look into the recent remarkable scholarship on the Greek into Arabic, Arabic into Latin translation movements from the 8th to the 12th centuries. Uh, I mentioned the, the path-breaking work of Richard Walzer, who I read when I was a student, his Greek into Arabic, essays on Islamic philosophy, and later the many works of Dimitri Gutas, uh, who's a professor at Yale, uh, and uh, and those of uh, Dag Nicholas Hesse, who's German, uh, and has published definitive works on the translation movements. Uh, these translation movements, involving thousands of texts for which the manuscripts are in many cases still extant, allowed classical Greek texts, and particularly those of Aristotle, a new European reception in the late Middle Ages, catalyzing the 12th century Renaissance, as Homer Walter uh, Haskins has argued so long ago. Um, but the translation movements were themselves fortuitous, and just as fortuitous was the concatenation of circumstances primarily the Protestant Reformation and aspirations to empire, which allowed the critical role of Islamic science and Islamic Aristotle commentary to be written out of history. The context for understanding Hobbes' astonishing philosophical feat in effectively helping consolidate the English Protestant Reformation has to be much broader than his immediate circles or intellectual career and nothing less than the history of the Aristotle commentary tradition as such. And I think I've made startling discoveries con uh, concerning the Aristotle commentary tradition, Greek, Syriac, Arabic, Hebrew, and Latin, and its impact not only on Hobbes' philosophical project, which was heavily tilted in the direction of Aristotle's physics, but also on the long medieval scholastic tradition of which he is a product. Hobbes product for its peculiar feature in the history of philosophy for the last two millennia, West and East, as far as Bactria, that's the same one in Afghanistan, that it largely took the form of Aristotle commentary. <clears throat> this had was more or less peculiar as having to do with the phenomenon of Hellenization, which was initially the project of Alexander the Great, whose teacher was Aristotle, and had the outcome that philosophy schools in Athens, Alexandria, later Constantine, Constantinople, and Antioch taught a logic-based curriculum requiring textual exegesis, commentary, and debate, known as school philosophy, for training judges, top civil servants, and clergy. This is the famous Organon. And this was the curriculum of the philosophy schools, as I say, in Athens, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Antioch. A rhetoric, it was not part of the curriculum, but belonged to an industry that grew up separately around the need for instruments of persuasion rather than pathways to truth. But the schools of rhetoric were established alongside philosophy schools designed for different clientele. And here we have a very early differentiation between philosophy and rhetoric, to which Hobbes also conforms. So when the Christianized Roman Empire, already divided into Western and Eastern spheres, under the pressure of heresies that hark back to pre-Christian religions, ceded most of the provinces of the East to Islam, Islam also adopted the Aristotle commentary tradition for the training of judges who substituted the clergy in a non-clerical religion. 
and must also arbitrate doctrinal disputes using the same techniques of exegesis, commentary, and debate, known as school philosophy. The decline into illiteracy of the Western Roman Empire and the loss by around the year 1000 of our era of all facility in the Greek tongue, except an island in Sicily, meant that it was mainly by virtue of the translation movements, Greek into Arabic from the 8th to the 10th centuries, and Arabic into Latin from around the 12th and 14th centuries, and the Islamic commentary tradition between the 9th and 12th centuries, that the Greek texts of Plato, Aristotle, Euclid, and Archimedes could be recirculated back to Europe. The Arabic translations comprise commentaries by Greek Neoplatonists, mainly from Alexandria and Asia Minor, who flourished up until Justinian closed the Athenian Academy in 529. Most famous of them were Alexandra, Alexandra of Abradesias, styled the commentator, who flourished in 2200 of our era, the non Christian Themistius in the 4th century, later prefect of Constantinople, Ammonius, in the 5th century, 5th, 6th century, who introduced a 6th century Alexandrian Aristotle commentary tradition, the Byzantine Greek Christian John the Lopinus, around 490 to 570, and Simplicius of Silesia, one of the last of the Neoplatonists, and among the pagan philosophers persecuted. Justinian, who reigned between 527 and 65. The translation movement, Greek into Arabic, was fortuitous because the shift from the Umayyad Caliphate in Damascus, which was Greek speaking, to the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad, founded in 762 in the heart of the old Sasanian Empire, which was not Greek speaking enabled the new caliphs to legitimize themselves by reclaiming the old Persian wisdom believed to have been stolen by Alexander the Great by translating all available Greek texts into Arabic. Uh, and of course they went overboard. <laughs> uh, so uh, Alexander apparently asked uh, for uh, to see the Persian manuscripts and uh, copied those he thought he wanted and then destroyed the originals. But manuscripts had been taken to China and India and they came back. And in this period, people had an amazing number of texts in their hands. Uh, so they overdid it. Uh, they set up, the Abbasid Caliphs set up what was called the School of Wisdom, which was a, a translation machine. And of course, at first, uh, they used uh, Nestorian Christians, they used Jews, they used uh, non Arabs who had facility in the Greek tongue. Uh, by the end of the translation movement, in the by the time of the commentary movement, um, commentators didn't necessarily know Greek, but they didn't have to because the translations were considered to be so good. The second phase of the translation movement from Arabic into Latin, uh, in which it was responsible as Haskins argues uh, for the 12th century Renaissance um, was also fortuitous because when the uh, <coughs> caliphate moved to Andalus in Spain, although the uh, Spain was an Arabic speaking country, the Cluniac monks of Toledo Cathedral who didn't read Arabic, wanted to study Arabic texts collected in the great libraries of Spain. And so the second translation movement began. Clergy of the Norman kingdoms of England and Sicily were prominent among the translators. 
are going to be led. And from at least the 12th century, the flow of Arabic translations and commentaries uh, reached uh, the universities of Paris and Oxford, hubs for the new scientific, well, uh, yeah, hubs for the new scientific theories to which the Arabic commentaries gave rise, prompting the condemnations of 1270 and 1277 by Bishop Tempier of Paris and the declaration of radical Aristotelianism or Averroist doctrines propagating Aristotle's materialist and deterministic physics to be heretical. It was this series of condemnations and the responses of ingenious scholastics who had to master materialist and mechanistic Aristotelian physics in order to refute heresy charges that paved the way for the materialist and mechanistic physics of Kepler in the 16th, 17th century and Galileo. The same scholastics who must also master doctrines concerning sensation and perception and related epistemology and ontology on which the, on which the Islamic commentators focused later paved the way for the doctrines of the Padua school to which the Averroists fleeing persecution in Paris escaped and it was the Padua school that the Cavendish and the censors to which Hobbes belonged had direct contact. So, among my most exciting encounters in reading Hobbes backwards is the recently rediscovered Merton Calculators, an Oxford school of 14th century logicians and physicists interested in questions of matter and motion, velocity and space generated by Aristotle's physics. These very questions have been declared heretical by the condemnations of 1270 and 1277 by the Bishop of Paris, Etienne Tempier, responding to the radical Aristotelianism or Averroism swept into the universities of Paris and Oxford, along with the flood of Arabic commentaries for which these universities were entry points. Um, to give you an example, even in Hobbes's day, the law was still standing uh, under Charles I that no ships of the Levant Company could re-enter the docks in London without having Arabic or Persian manuscripts on board. Most of those ended up in the Bodleian Library. So beneficiaries of the translation movement, Greek into Arabic and Arabic and Latin, the Oxford calculators undertook commentaries of their own, of which Aristotle's physics was the most commented upon work, as well as writing scientific works on newly discovered theories of optics, mathematics, motion, weight, philosophy, space, and place, and their theological implications. Among the core group of Oxford calculators, Thomas Bradwardine, uh, he lived 1349, John Dumbleton, around the same period, William Hatesbury, and William and Richard Swineshead uh, were prominent. Richard Swineshead was renowned for his Calculationum, Book of Calculations, around 1350, which earned him the moniker, the calculator. While William Hatesbury, who was the bursar of Merton in the 1330s, developed the mean speed theorem known as the law of falling bodies, later credited to Galileo. John Wycliffe, Merton Fellow and Reformer, he was singled out by Hobbes as a precursor of Luther in the closing lines of the Historia Ecclesiastica, has been characterized as the black sheep of the Oxford calculators. Significantly, Hobbes signs off his poem with this allude to Luther and Islam and printing as sounding the death knell of the papal monarchy and in that order. It is possible that Hobbes, who several times insisted, I do not reason, I calculate, 
He had encountered the Milton calculators when he studied logic at Oxford, as a hint in his first beta suggests, in his first beta lines 35 to 49. He tells us how he mastered the medieval modes of logic, but then dispensed with them because he realized that sense could tell him all he needed to know. With direct reference, of course, to Aristotle's physics. Already in 1590, Isaac Casabon, the renowned Huguenot antiquarian and member of James I's circle, published a complete work of Aristotle, which listed around 300 Aristotle commentators, ancient Greek, Byzantine, Islamic, Jewish, medieval, and Renaissance. And this list is followed by a detailed inventory of individual commentaries <coughs> arranged by the Aristotelian text upon which they comment. Moreover, the names of Oxford logicians appear alongside those of Greek and Arabic Aristotle commentators in the little examined book lists in Robert Payne's hand, known as Chatsworth Manuscripts 1 and 2. It has to be said that uh, Hobbes uh, was greatly privileged in that a special collect library collection uh, was set up for him by his patron. Um, and uh, we have an annotated list of that collection in Hobbes' own hand for the 1650s. After that, Hobbes' hand is too palsied and the uh, Lists are uh, uh, written by his amanuensis, Robert Payne. Uh, but among these books lists, there's one, uh, these, there are these two manuscripts, E1, Chatsworth manuscripts, E1 and E2. And uh, those book lists are related to an intermediary who followed Hobbes' project closely in Paris, Canel Digby, uh, who was one of the uh, Catholic uh, members of the circle of Henrietta Maria in Paris, and the wife of Charles Dickens. Um, Chatsworth Manuscript E1, which is entitled Sir Canelm Digby's Manuscript, 1634, comprises collection, a manuscript selected from the collection that Canelm Digby, Digby had inherited from his Oxford tutor, Thomas Ellick Allen, and gifted to the Bodleian Library, along with a large cache of Arabic manuscripts gifted to St. John's College, Oxford. Accordingly, the manuscripts listed in manuscript E1 are identified by a core number corresponding to Digby's original catalogue, followed by the Bodleian core number. The list includes manuscripts of at least 20 works of Roger Bacon, 1220 to 92, an important predecessor of the Oxford calculators. All 20 of these items have core numbers, and at least another 14 are listed as desiderata and do not have core numbers. Manuscript E1 also includes a manuscript copy of the commentary by Rob, Robert Grosser Tester of the 12th century on 13th century on Aristotle's De Anima. Grosser Tester was another predecessor of the Milton calculators who was greatly influenced by the Arabic commentaries. Among the items listed as desiderata is a work on optics by John Dumbleton, the Oxford calculator, who also wrote an exposition of Redwardine's De Proposionibus, and whose major work, A Summary of Logic and Natural Philosophy, a large-scale exposition of Aristotle's physics for at least for which there are at least 20 manuscript copies extant, was left unfinished at his death because he died of a plague in early age. Talking about pandemics. Manuscript E1 also includes a Greek commentary on Plato's Parmenides by Proclus, 
the Byzantine Neoplatonists, the celebrated work on optics, on rays by the Abbasid polymath al Kindi, and ex excerpts from the opera Quisio uh, uh, Averroes and on the rays, types uh, attributed to Galileo, but probably by Grosseteus, they are heavily indebted to al Masar, the Abbasid astronomer. Enrico Paghi, who first published Chatsworth Manuscript E1, considered it important as indicating the sources of Hobbes' philosophical and scientific interests for a precise period around 1634, in which his own studies had not yet seen the light of day. Chatsworth Manuscript E2, once again comprising works gifted by Canel and Digby to the Bodleian Library from the collection bequeathed to him by Thomas Allen, lists almost 900 print books and some manuscripts. The source of manuscript, Chatsworth Manuscript E2, is also believed to be the Bodleian Library catalogues, whose mistakes it replicates. Enrico Paghi, who first published Manuscript E2, believes it to have constituted Hobbes' ideal library, the teaching of seven the seven liberal arts. Uh, and Malcolm believes it could have been compiled by Payne as an aid to Hobbes' tuition of the Earl of Devonshire, but that may have only come to Hobbes' possession after Payne's death. But it would still be noteworthy, because as of course Bradicom had comments, it does record an archive to which Hobbes may well have had access as being in the possession of one of his associates, whom Hobbes knew in Paris. And the structure of Chatsworth Manuscript E2 does suggest a curriculum. Books are catalogued by subject and list the number of titles comprising scientific method, grammar and language, arithmetic, geometry, music, astronomy, astrology, optics and perspective, philosophy and various, along with military and politics. Of the list of 889 books and manuscripts that Chatsworth Manuscript E2 lists, we have nine editions of Euclid's Elements and two commentaries. Works by Ptolemy, the Alexandrian mathematician, the commentary on Ptolemy by Proclus, works by the Aristotle commentator Philoponus Grammaticus, a Neoplatonist by the scholastics Bonaventura and Albert of Saxony, as well as works by the Oxford philosophers Roger Bacon, Chris Teste, Duns Scotus, and the Oxford calculators, Brad Watine, and Richard Swainshead. I go through this as carefully as I do, just to show that these works by the Oxford calculators certainly would have come to Oxford's attention, given these manuscripts. For the Arabs, the Chatsworth manuscript E2 lists a number of manuscripts, one attributed to Muhammad, another to Adelaide of Bar, very prolific among the translators from Arabic into Latin, and the first translator of the Arabic Euclid, for which the manuscript is still extant, stand, as well as the works of Averroes, while the Hobbes' own time at least the German astronomer Johannes Kepler, Alexandro Pellini, the astronomer who studied at Padua, Galileo, and the Calvinist scholastic, Bartolomeus Kekerman. Well, we now have to consider how the universities was shaped by the pre into Arabic, Arabic into Latin translation movements, of which Hobbes, I argue, was a long-term beneficiary. And nobody's really told this whole story. Medieval scholasticism, or school philosophy, grew up at the universities as they evolved out of cathedral schools. Preeminent among them was the 12th century School of Chartres and the 13th century universities of Paris and Oxford. The term scholasticism, scholasticism referred 
specifically to their curricula based on the commentary and discussion of Aristotle's logic, known as the organon or the instrument, and comprising six books, the categories on interpretation, prior analytics, post theory analytics, topics, and on statistical reputation. They weren't known under this rubric, the organon in Aristotle's day, but are considered to be first organized by the head of the Athenian Peripatetic School, Andronicus of Rhodes, around uh, 60 BCE, and were very much commented upon in philosophy schools of Athens, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Antioch. Uh, from there, they were transmitted through the Abbasid Empire, founded in 750 CE in Arabic, often by Syriac translations and studied along with Aristotle's literature and poetics. As in the case of the later Christian West, this early Aristotle-based curriculum faced constraints that were theologically given. So, uh, the early Syriac translations of Aristotle were restricted to the categories uh, and so on, for which we have evidence in a report by Abu Nasser al Baghavi, who records uh, the bishops assembled and took counsel together on which parts of the teaching of philosophy should be kept and which should be abolished. They decided that the books on logic could be taught up to the Esoteric figures, but no further since they believed that anything beyond would harm Christianity. Whereas the permitted material could be used for the promotion of the creed. And when Robert de Poisson approved the founding statutes of the University of Paris, one of them forbade the arts masters for lecturing on Aristotelian metaphysics and natural science. Um, As Hobbes uh, frequently observed, universities in the Western world were basically papal foundations for the teaching of theology. They had a long prehistory dating from the time the Greek schools of philosophy first became Christianized, uh, but always theology uh, was the uh, primary discipline and uh, it was considered a handmaiden of the sacred scriptures. Uh, so even the Cappadocian fathers, so influential in the time of Constantine, Basil the Great, the bishop of uh, Caesarea, his brother Gregory of Nias, and a close friend Gregory of Nadianus, patriarch of Constantinople, had all studied arts and philosophy at Athens before they became and expounded the doctrine of the Messiah. So as we shall see, the Aristotle commentary tradition was more or less continuous since the time of Aristotle himself, demonstrating extraordinary durability in terms of the problems it encountered and their solutions, which did not change much given that the schools of Alexandria and Antioch had been Christianized so early, and that the other great monotheisms, Judaism and Islam, also prioritize theology. So, without being able to fully treat the topic under discussion, it's my purpose to show that Hobbes' indebtedness to medieval scholasticism, a continuous teaching tradition at Paris and Oxford for at least 400 years, becomes apparent in the way in which he frames his philosophical project. And I think that examining Hobbes' philosophical system with reference to this scholastic tradition can solve many puzzles that have eluded modern commentators. Uh, the question, that, for instance, of uh, atomism, um, the priority that's been given to Epicureanism uh, in the which, uh, following the Poggio Bracolini's discovery, rediscovery of the manuscript of Lucretius de Rerum Natura in 1417, so that even Hobbes' Epicureanism has been assimilated to this tradition and, and even by me. Uh, but in fact, as 
Aruli and Robert points out, atomists never ceased to exist as a theory of matter and time, both in West and Latin traditions, in the Arabic and Jewish medieval philosophy, being developed in different forms for different purposes, from theological explanations of the creation of pure uh, mathematical theories, theological explanations of the pure math math mathematical theories about the divisibility of the continuum through physical theories of matter and time. In terms of the timeline for medieval atomism, there are two important periodizations, which also coincide with the high point of Arabic translations and Arabic commentary. The first detailed accounts of atomism come from the 9th and 10th century Arabic theologians of Baghdad and Basra, Robert maintains immediately followed by the Jewish schools, notably and in Egypt. And a similar number of revival of atomism appeared in the West from the 12th century philosophers of Shut to the 14th century Christian theologians of Oxford and Paris. So, Hobbes, by renaming Leviathan, his uh, text Leviathan, curiously, and this is also fortuitous, uh, effective a paradigm shift. It's very interesting that if you look carefully at Leviathan, um, as I say, the frontispiece is a perfect illustration of the corpus mysticum and the idea of the incorporation of citizens in the body of the king. It's quite, in, it is very interesting that in Hobbes' Leviathan, uh, his famous chapter 16, his theory of authorized of, uh, uh, persons, authors, and things personated, is an account of incorporation and representation. Uh, David Dysonhaus, who's uh, a philosophy laureate Toronto, and also a Hobbes specialist, has written a book called The Long Arc of Legality, in which he argues that Hobbes was responsible for a theory of absolute sovereignty that also, curiously, became a theory of representation and ultimately of democratic representation, this idea that the people were incorporated in the sovereign. Uh, and a lot of people have said, you know, well, Actually, Hobbes was a materialist, and he couldn't possibly subscribe uh, to the persona ficta, the idea of this uh, fictitious persona who, uh, in which the king is uh, the figure for the incorporation of its subjects. But I have argued elsewhere that, in fact, uh, there are other extenuating circumstances that have not been considered. One of these was the synods of Tonine and Dort, 
One of the, these was the role that James I was called upon to play in the lead up to the Thirty Years' War and failed, failed miserably. Um, extraordinarily, this, the Synod of um, Tanaim was in uh, 1616, so the Thirty Years' War broke out in 1618 was one of the most extraordinary synods you'd ever come across. Um, they were so sophisticated. It, it was an attempt by the Protestant confessions, both Lutheran and Calvinist, uh, to come together and to very, very non-essential differences in their doctrines um, to prevent the outbreak of war. Um, and James I, as a Protestant prince, was courted by the Huguenots and the Lutherans. Uh, they uh, went uh, to England and uh, consulted with them. The trouble is that uh, James I was uh, a narcissist, and he just involved them in writing his sacred works, which he then passed off as his own. So they had no success with James the First. Uh, and when that uh, synod broke down, the synod of Tanaim, it broke down because there was no sovereign authority capable of keeping people to their word. And I believe that that was Hobbes's take away from the role of James I. Had the synods of Tanine and Dort, where it was all over by the synod of Dort, really, um, been successful, it would have prevented a war whose mortality rates were never matched in Europe until the last days of World War. One fifth of the German population was destroyed, was killed. Mortality rates are frightful. And one out of two in a corridor from the Black Forest uh, to the North Sea, the Baltic, um, Pomerania. And it was mainly, it was mainly within the German the Holy Roman Empire, the German lands that these uh, mortality rates held. Uh, the Scandinavians and others joined into the 30, world, the 30 Years' War in order to get their slice of ter territory or to preserve their interests. And I do believe that when Hobbes quoted that line from the Book of Job and makes it the flyer, on the front page of the Bible, there is no power on earth compared to him. He was referring to this absolute power of the sovereign as being essential to the maintenance of peace. It's also the case and this is not, I investigated this in an article I wrote on Quentin Skinner's Artificial Person of the State. It was also, why would Hobbes be really interested in this persona? Victor? Why would he really be interested in uh, the Corpus Mysticum? The reason is uh, that uh, this had already entered Law. Cook, for whom Hobbes has respect, but of course is very ambiguous about, um, realized, uh, had already documented uh, the way in which uh, corporations had entered, entered into English public law. Uh, so that the persona victor, 
as a fictitious entity was already something uh, Hobbes had, uh, anyone had to acknowledge as belonging to the English legal system, and Hobbes would undoubtedly have been aware of famous cases like Sutton's Hospital, uh, where uh, Cook was able to uh, establish that uh, a benefaction made by Sutton uh, to preserve uh, a hospital as a charitable trust uh, was properly constituted because of uh, this idea of the corporation as a fictitious person. Um, and indeed, of course, uh, the whole range of charitable trusts that included universities, uh, hospitals, and even a bridge, Hobbes points out, uh, for the maintenance uh, where objects and official representatives for their maintenance and well-being uh, depended on uh, the persona fictor. And this theory of uh, representation and cooperation that Hobbes finally includes in his Leviathan. He doesn't throw it out when he entitles, when he changes the title. Uh, so this has basically not been uh, considered. People have considered the, uh, Quinn and Skinner has admirably considered the uh, parliamentary debates, but most people have not looked at the case law. Uh, and I think the case law is absolutely uh, definitive. Uh, so I, I, it's my belief that indeed Hobbes did uh, decide to rename his work Leviathan at the last moment, when 37 chapters of the proposed 50, which actually only came to 48, were completed. And that the reasons that he did it uh, are not only because he accepted Waldock's idea that the Leviathan was a figure for incorporation, but also in light of the Synod of Donain and the failure uh, to prevent war due to the um, a lack of a, an absolute authority capable of commanding compliance, as well as the fact that the corporation had already entered common law. Uh, and it, it, actually, it's interesting that this library that Hobbes was responsible for putting in place at Chatsworth, and which is his patron paid for, included um, already in the 1630s all the documents that Hobbes needed to complete, all of uh, the reports of Cook, all of the church histories, um, uh, and so on. Uh, it didn't include any of the uh, glossators or post or any of the um, any of the texts around the formation of the papal doctrine of uh, the Corpus Mysticum, but it did include all of the church histories, theological works, uh, and legal texts to sustain my sustain my hypothesis. So it's possible that as early as the 1630s, I do believe that even as the early as early as the 1630s Hobbes had conceived this project, he certainly hadn't thought about the Leviathan as part of the project until very late. But uh, it protected him really because Leviathan could be taken as a decoy. It accommodated the 
Puritans and uh, it included the ancient Israel covenanting, covenanting and, and so on and so forth. So it gave the meaning of Leviathan, I think, a completely different twist. Uh, whereas I do believe, and I do believe that Hobbes was deadly afraid that his work would otherwise have been taken for a work that was too scholastic, far too dependent on scholasticism. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Yes, certainly. Um, uh, so, do we have any questions from the floor to begin with? Um, we might okay. start. Uh, if uh, if anyone has a question for Patricia in the Zoom, um, if you could uh, just put the letter Q in the chat, Tristan will draw that to my attention. Um, but Tristan has a question for Patricia first off. Uh, um, so Tristan. Yeah, sorry for jumping in straight away, but I have numerous questions. Um, thanks very much. I find this fascinating. Um, I guess my, my most straightforward question um, is, I, want, I still want to know uh, what role pride has in the figure of Leviathan in its adaptation or use by Hobbes, because my understanding of the Job passage from which um, Leviathan is, is discussed is he's referred to as the king of pride and king over the people of pride. And so I'm wondering, is there an easy way to um, figure pride in this, or is this just a, a non-essential characteristic of Leviathan from the Bible that Hobbes doesn't really intend to carry over? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, the line, the lines that Hobbes only includes actually in that little banner that runs across the top. Uh, uh, there is no power on earth to be compared to him. Uh, so that's the crux of it for you, and the pride. That's the crux it. of it for me. But maybe, yes, uh, maybe it's pride that's keeping the subjects. From complying. I don't know, but I think this is I think this is the crux of it for me. Yeah. Because of, uh, he's fearful. Um, when Hobbes talks about his work um, in his verse meter, he refers to the as known his book Leviathan as known by its dreadful name. So, in most of the cases I can think of, it's this idea of terrifying power that's necessary to preserve the peace. But it could well, I remember the mention of pride. It, it, it could also be that, um, yeah, it's pride that stops people from accepting their pathway. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Tom Corbin has a question. Tom. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. This actually follows from Tristan's point, because I was going to ask a very similar thing. In fact, possibly identical things. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I, I might just add a little bit more, and I'd just really like to hear, Patricia, if you think this uh, supports you, the way that you've been reading Hobbes or detracts. Uh, before that, I just want to say, the, the amount of scholarship here is just overwhelming it's just so impressive it's really wonderful to hear that uh but anyway um on tristan's point um the uh the pride thing for me is is really important and um and really goes some way to uh clarifying hobbes distinction with especially papal political theology so the king over the children of pride uh haig patapan's written on this i've written on this as well um, is perhaps important because it's a real distinction from a political understanding of pride in papal uh, accounts. So for Hobbes, in his Laws of Nature, he defines pride as thinking you of yourself as greater than other people, 
Whereas in scholastic thought, it's uh, thinking of yourself greater than God. So in the uh, classic church fathers, pride is the thing which prevents social change. So Gregory the Great, for example, talks about uh, slaves should, even though slaves are equal to their masters, they're both made in the eyes of God. They shouldn't think more, they shouldn't think poorly of their masters because that would be prideful. And Hobbes talks about this in Leviathan, I think in Behemoth as well about priests relying on pride to enforce their authority because people can't question the authority of the priests because that is then down by God. So by changing this from a thinking you know more than God to thinking your, yourself is greater th than the other people, that seems to take a lot of the power away from the kind of the chain of hierarchical power through the papacy and change it in a quite strong way. I don't know. I, I'd just like to hear your thoughts a little bit more on whether that's a a, a supporting a claim for your reading of Hobbes or whether that might be a different way of thinking about how Hobbes is taking a lot of the scholastic tradition, taking a lot of the papal political theology and slightly changing it, but reinforcing it for his material or uh, Protestant uh, views. Thank you so much for that intervention. I've learned a great deal from it. Um, I will have to read your work and read these works you were talking about. Um, but I, I think, uh, yes, I think it probably is something he works at. Uh, quite likely, I mean, certainly these, this passage from Job opens up lots of opportunities. Uh, and... Uh, I think pride is something I haven't thought enough about, but I'll think more about it in the future. Um, I have another question. That's okay. Sorry for hogging the floor. <laughs> so, um, you know, my admittedly um, pathetic understanding of Hobbes in comparison with yours um, uh, has, has always uh, understood that Euclidean geometry plays a very important role in Hobbes's kind of, especially methodological um, um, agreements, so like by the time of Leviathan, and it goes around, uh, kind of revolves around an anecdote, which is that he um, stumbles upon a proof of Pythagoras' theorem um, by Euclid, and he initially thinks this is ludicrous, then follows the proof, and by the end of it is persuaded that it's absolutely correct, and he's so struck by this that he thinks this is the way to argue and then follows that kind of methodology into his own social political thinking. Um, what do you think about that for one? Is it, do you think that's the spurious anecdote or is that kind of um, say something meaningful about Hobbes' work? And then relatedly, if it does say something about Hobbes' work, how do we fit that within this uh, notion of the Aristotelianism at work in Hobbes' life? Well, I, I, that's interesting. This anecdote is widely discussed. As I recall, the modern consensus, or the current consensus, is that it's a method of demonstration that appeals to Hobbes. Now, Hobbes, Hobbes' big innovation in the Aristotelian commentary tradition is really something he got from one of the members of the Huguenot school, uh, Dumelin, who wrote uh, a work that uh, Hobbes held in his library, and that uh, argued he was also in the same tradition as Hobbes, uh, and part of uh, James I's circle. Uh, and he argued that um, ordinary sense perception enables people to uh, understand the elements of logic uh, and that uh, it should then be, in demonstration, it should then be set out in chains of uh, argument. Uh, and uh, I think the trouble is that his handbook on logic, which was widely acknowledged, um, 
Uh, Hobson certainly read it because he's the one who has the uh, theory about uh, the, the power of the Pope being that of a deceased Roman emperor, which of course Hobbes takes over. Um, but I think Hobbes shows that uh, people largely considered that uh, the conclusions of banal would be banal uh, from Dumoulin's hypothesis would be banal. And Hobbes argues that they, uh, they wouldn't be banal um, because it's this shift within the Aristotelian tradition to the idea that's largely due to the work done by the Arabic commentators on sensation and the difference between humans and animals on sensation and so on, that human beings, this was Hobbes' conviction from the beginning, from his earliest statement of his project, that human beings through sense experience um, realize, understand the truths of the logic. Uh, and so, this claim of this anecdote is now read as being his confirmation that, yes, this is what I was talking about. Uh, that's the most I can say. Thank you. And you have a I do. I do have a, 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 a combination of question and just a, something to bring us to a conclusion. Uh, your last page, your last couple of paragraphs, um, move from very fine-grained, close readings of, of the scholarly material to very large, sweeping claims about the history of science that are Hobbes in, in the history of science. And I was just wondering if, as a kind of just as, you know, very briefly, you could um, turn to, you know, how you see uh, what you've been working on here as constituting a paradigm shift, because you, you go on to say that this is a paradigm that we still inhabit. And that, if I'm not mistaken, you see Hobbes as the kind of pivotal figure in a synthesis of the Aristotelian commentary tradition with the reception of Lucretius's Epicureanism and the possibilities that all of this, in addition to the Reformation, produces in a kind of crucible of the early 17th century the possibilities of a new scientific revolution. This, this, the larger, if I'm to pan back to the larger kind of place of all of this in, the, in making sense of the transition from sort of medieval worldview to a kind of scientific worldview, is that <clears throat> that was a correct summation? Well, yes, because I think that um, as we can see, I mean, it's very interesting about Bishop Tempier's condemnations because by having voiced them and specified them, there are, you know, he gives a number to each of the uh, condemnations, that put the issues that would be otherwise indiscussable, undiscussable, right on the table. So they had to address them. So it actually turned out, the condemnations turned out to, to, to do yeah. the opposite of what... Absolutely did. counterproductive. So uh, the scholastics, you know, Thomas Aquinas was one of the ones condemned because Thomas Aquinas had gone to the University of Naples, where I once gave a lecture, I'm proud to say, um, which had been founded by um, the Holy Roman Emperor uh, and uh, whose mother was Sicilian, especially to curate Arabic manuscripts. So um, Aquinas was in conversation with uh, Averus and so on, uh, Avicenna, for instance, and uh, their views were remarkably similar. So. Aquinas was one of the ones who stood condemned. But once Tempier had <clears throat> issued these condemnations and specified, they uh, were not only free to, but morally as obliged to think through all of these uh, issues about Aristotle's physics, the eternity of matter, uh, the role of sensation, and so on, that otherwise they would have been prevented, forbidden. 
from addressing. So I think that it just was a matter of time. It took a long time. Like there's somebody I know what's his name has done an essay on Lucene's conversion, and he thinks that Hobbes was uh, partly responsible. But it took them a long time. Even this Paris group, which were mainly minimum fathers and priests and so on. Um, a long time to think this through before they would finally uh, concede. I mean, Galileo was quite free in acknowledging that he was in the medieval tradition. Um, but I think it just took time. And then when it, when the time came, um, the positions of Galileo and so on were, well, with some exceptions, uh, their time had come, and uh, this physicalist Aristotle uh, of the commentary tradition uh, triumphed. I mean, one has to remember what a, 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 the day in the life of a student really was. They went to a lecture in the morning. They had to memorize it, and then a senior tutor would hear them repeat the lecture. So that all of those commentaries, as hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts were extant because there was no printed texts. And uh, they were fairly well internalized for them to be able to reproduce that lecture at the end of the afternoon. Mm. Thomas Corbin has one more question and then I finish this off. Okay. I apologize, I have to leave. I have a I train to catch. But Thomas will take you I'm out. So this, grateful to well, you. this way I don't have to cut Thomas off for you. Can, so I can shut the turn down. So apologies for having yeah. a scoop. Thomas. Thank you uh, so much. Just a uh, small finger on uh, the point just before the last one. Uh, on uh, scholastic logic. I was just wondering if you could just comment briefly on how you saw Hobbes's translation of Aristotle's rhetoric fitting into this, because obviously a lot of people read that as informing Leviathan in particular. So I was just wondering if you had any just brief <laughs> commentary on that. Look, I don't. It's ages since I've read Hobbes's commentary on Aristotle's rhetoric. I just, I just, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, it's obvious all plays in, and you probably know more than I do on these things. <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah, I think Aristotle's uh, Hobbes' commentary is could be read in a bunch of ways. So, I suppose it could be read as jumping on one side or the other. So, uh, I just, I, I don't have any particular views on it. Well, thanks for your, thanks for your contribution today, though. No, I, I, wonderful to be here. Really fabulous talk. Thank you so much yeah. for spending the time talking this to us. Tip of a very rich iceberg, I think. Um, uh, can't wait for the book to come out. Thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll close it off there. And uh, we'll see you in the next uh, workshop um, towards the end of September. Thank you.